Hello, and welcome to the National Park Service and the Federal Aviation Administration public meeting for the draft air tour management plan for Bandelier National Monument. I'm Michelle Carter, an environmental protection specialist with the National Park Service, and I'll be your moderator this evening. I'd like to start off by defining a couple of acronyms that you'll hear us use. You'll hear us refer to the National Park Service as NPS, the Federal Aviation Administration as FAA, and the Air Tour Management Plans as ATMPs. We'll define the remaining acronyms as we go along with the presentations. Next slide, please. So we're holding this virtual public meeting to review the draft ATMP for Bandelier and to seek public feedback on the draft. The meeting is being held pursuant to the National Parks Air Tour Management Act of 2000, also known as NAPATMA, and its implementing regulations. You'll hear more about NAPATMA and the draft ATMP shortly, along with information on how you can submit questions and official comments. But before we dive into the presentations, I want to take a minute to introduce our presenters and provide you with a little bit more information about meeting logistics and how you can participate. Next slide. So joining us this evening as presenters are Keith Lusk, the program manager and special program staff with the Western Pacific region of FAA. From the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division of the NPS, we have Vicki Ward, Overflights Program Manager, and Scott McFarland, Field Program Lead. And from Bandelier National Monument, we have the Park Superintendent, Superintendent Patrick Sudeth. So Keith and Vicki will give us a brief overview of NAPATMA and the purpose of today's meeting. And then we'll hear from Patrick and Scott who will share information from the park's perspective and discuss park specific resources and the draft ATMP. Next slide, please. Throughout the meeting, we invite you to submit your questions, which we'll address at the end as part of the Q&A session. Questions submitted through this evening's meeting will be considered as the agencies continue to draft developing the ATMP, but they won't actually be considered formal comments. Next slide, please. All official comments must be submitted through the NPS Planning, Environment, and Public Comment, or Pepsi site, or sent to the mailing addresses listed on the park's Pepsi site. Only those comments received through one of those two avenues will be considered part of the official record. The agencies will not be accepting comments via email. And I'll share a little bit more information uh, about this later in the presentation. And I also wanted to point out that these formal comments must be sub submitted on or before October 3rd of this year. Next slide, please. So this meeting is being live streamed across Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. If you're watching on one of these platforms, please submit your questions using the link to the Google form that FAA will post into the little chat area of the platform that you're using. When the time comes, we'll read your question aloud and our presenters will respond. The team will do their best to get to all of the questions, but in the event we don't get to yours, we'll provide contact information at the end of the meeting where you can go for post-meeting follow-up. So our meeting will be 90 minutes long. We'll adjourn at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And if we get through all of the questions early, we'll keep the meeting active until 6 o'clock in, in case additional questions come in. And, and please note this meeting will be recorded. We appreciate you joining us this evening to learn more about Bandelier's draft ATMP. We'll now play a short video overview before I turn it over to Keith and Vicki to provide additional details about APATMA and why we're here today. The United States is home to some of the most breathtaking national parks and tribal lands in the world. It is important that we protect these lands while ensuring that the public has ample opportunity to enjoy these national treasures. Air tours offer the public a totally different type of experience. The Federal Aviation Administration and the National Park Service work together to manage air tours over national parks. We are developing plans that help protect wildlife, wilderness character, cultural resources, natural soundscapes, and visitor enjoyment. These plans are known as air tour management plans. And today, we will explore the specifics of the draft plan for your park. As part of our planning process, we consult with tribes, native Hawaiian organizations, 
state and tribal historic preservation officers, and wildlife biologists. We assess noise, wildlife protection, and other environmental considerations, and we'll continue to make adjustments to these plans as needed. And we consider the appropriate level of National Environmental Policy Act review for these plans. The FAA and the National Park Service are committed to ensuring safe flights at our national parks while safeguarding park resources. Following today's presentation, we encourage you to review your park's draft air tour management plan and provide official comments through the National Park Service Planning, Environment, and Public Comment website. Together, we can celebrate these special places and ensure they can be enjoyed for generations to come. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Lusk, and I'm a program manager with the Federal Aviation Administration. I'm here with my colleague, Vicki Ward from the National Park Service, and we're going to provide you with a little background and context about the National Parks Air Tour Management Act, as well as air tour management plans in general. Next slide, please. So the National Parks Air Tour Management Act was enacted in April of 2000 with subsequent amendment provisions added in the year 2012. And basically at a high level it requires, the act requires that the Federal Aviation Administration in cooperation with the National Park Service develop air tour management plans for those parks and tribal lands where operators have applied to conduct commercial air tours. It's important to note really what these air tour managements apply to and what they do not apply to. The act strictly applies to commercial air tour operations that occur over a national park unit or within a half mile of the park boundary or over tribal lands within or abutting that national park unit. In terms of the airspace that we're looking at for uh, commercial air tour operations to be considered a commercial air tour over park, it's uh, flights that occur basically between ground level and up to 5,000 feet above ground level. If they're flying over a park transiting through that area, higher than 5,000 feet AGL over the park, they would, need, would not be captured um, by the requirements of the act or this plan. Next slide, please. As noted, the act really only applies to commercial air tour operations. It does not capture or apply to general aviation activity that may occur in the area around or over the park. It does not apply to commercial airline operations or activities or military flights, strictly commercial air tour operations. That's the basis of the aircraft operations that we're looking uh, to provide for in this plan for Bandelier. It also does not apply to any Alaska parks. When the original legislation was written, it specifically exempted any national park units in Alaska from the provisions of the requirements of the National Parks Air Tour Management Act. It also does not cover air tour operations at Grand Canyon National Park that is covered under its own separate legislation. Um, and it also is not applicable or does not allow, I should say, uh, commercial air tour operations over Rocky Mountain National Park. And again, that was in the original uh, 2000 uh, legislation. One of the new amendment provisions that happened in 2012 um, was the provision to exempt parks, lower activity parks, those parks with 50 or fewer annual air tour operations from having the requirement to develop an air tour management plan. That provision also allowed the Park Service to withdraw that exemption if they still felt the need that either a voluntary agreement or an air tour management plan was necessary at the park to protect park resources, visitor experience or other types of resource concerns uh, from the park. Bandelier is not on the exempt park list, hence we are doing air tour management plan uh, for this park. If abutting tribal lands are or may be overflown, uh, tribes will be invited in as a cooperating agency for purpose of compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act. 
we'll talk a little bit more about National Environmental Policy Act compliance and the requirements associated with that in some later slides. Next slide, please. It's important to note that the original legislation made a distinction between two types of operators. There's, they were spelled out in the act. There are those that are uh, considered existing operators and those that would be considered uh, new entrant operators. All air tour operators that wanted to fly over a national park unit were required to apply for the FAA for what is called operating authority to operate over those national park units. When they did this application process, and this was back in the 2003 timeframe roughly, um, the FAA looked through those applications, reviewed those and provided them, those operators who applied by a selected date in 2003 with what was called interim operating authority, which was basically a annual not to exceed number, um, identifying the number of tours they could fly over that park. And it was based on the number of tours that they had done before the act came into effect. So basically pre 2000, it was based on um, either a one or a three year average on those one or three years prior to the act. Um, and as I mentioned, the, FAA granted them what was called interim operating authority, and they can continue to fly up to those annual levels until such time as the FAA and the Park Service would develop an air tour management plan. The other type of operator is called a new entrant operator. And as you could guess, those are operators who weren't existing at, or conducting tours at the time the act went into effect. So basically those um, that started flying at these parks um, after the act came into effect. Those are called new entrant operators. There's provision and a process um, that is spelled out in the act as to how the agencies um, would handle those applications and what the review process would entail. Basically, the FAA would look at it from a safety perspective, ensure that um, the introduction, the potential introduction of a new entrant at a park uh, would not any, introduce any adverse um, effects on the national airspace system. And the park would really be looking at it from a resource protection standpoint to make sure that the those new air tours potentially would uh, have some adverse impacts or effects on the park. Um, I should note that in the case of Bandelier, the one operator there is considered a, an existing operator. He's been flying over the park for decades, in fact. So this plan that we've developed, we're not introducing new air tours over Bandelier. In fact, we're just trying to manage the tours um, that have been occurring uh, for quite some time over the park. Next slide, and I think I will pass it over to Vicki. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Yeah, I'm Vicki Ward with the National Park Service, and I'll continue giving the overview of the National Park Air Tour Management Act. Uh, under the act, uh, the objective of an air tour management plan is, is very specific, and that air tour management plan must develop acceptable and effective measures to mitigate or prevent the significant and adverse impacts, if any, resulting from commercial air tour operations upon natural and cultural resources, visitor experiences, and tribal lands. Next slide. The act also uh, specifies what an air tour management plan should include and under an air tour management plan, it could in prohibit commercial air tour operations in whole or in part. So air tours could be banned from the whole park or they could still occur over part of the park. Uh, different times of year, uh, they could be allowed and maybe not allowed over the park different other times of year. It also would establish conditions for the conduct of those air tour operations, which would include routes, altitudes, time of day restrictions and restrictions for particular events. So if something's happening at a park on a particular day that uh, they, they would like some uh, quiet time, they can request that. And then also it would specify the maximum number of flights, which could be on a daily basis, a yearly basis or seasonal basis. And currently none of these uh, provisions are in place right now with the under interim operating authority, the air term management plan would include these elements. 
As mentioned earlier, it only applies to commercial air tour operations that are within one half mile outside the boundary of the national park or below 5,000 feet above ground level. An air tour management plan must also include incentives for the adoption of quiet aircraft technology. These are types of aircraft that have some quieter characteristics than, than the regular helicopters or fixed wing aircraft, depending on the model. And the air tour management plan also must include uh, an allocation of those opportunities to, to conduct the air tours when the air tour management plan limits the number of operations. Um, and then each air tour management plan includes a section that justifies and documents the need for the measures taken in the air tour management plan. So justify the, the need to establish a specific route or a specific altitude, whether that's to protect specific park resources, natural, cultural, or for other uh, reasons at the park. And all those justifications are included in that air tour management plan. And they're also included in the record of decision at the end of the air tour management planning process. Next slide. In this slide, if anybody is calling in, I'll just briefly describe it. It's a map showing the, the United States and the locations of the parks where we are doing air tour management plans. We are currently working on plans for 24 parks and those range across the country, you know, from the southeast to ever, you know, with Everglades and, and New York parks and the national New York Harbor area. Uh, Great Smokies is coming up later this month for a uh, public meeting. And then we have a cluster of parks in Utah. And then obviously, you know, we're here tonight for Vandalier National Monument uh, draft air tour management plan. And then there are plans being developed for the parks in the San Francisco Bay Area, a couple parks in Washington, and then also two parks in Hawaii. Next slide. So our process for uh, developing an air tour management plan, uh, the act requires that we publish the proposed air tour management plan in the Federal Register. And we hold at least one public meeting to get public input on the proposed air tour management plan, which is why we're, we're having this meeting today. Uh, the air tour management plan will also comply with the National Environmental Policy Act and other legal requirements such as the National Historic Preservation Act and Endangered Species Act. And then as also mentioned too, we uh, would invite tribes to participate as cooperating agencies for the National Environmental Policy Act compliance in cases where the tribal lands are or may be overflown by the air tours. And uh, just, just so we will say it again, but the purpose of today's meeting is to review the components of the draft air tour management plan. And so we're glad you could join us uh, for this. And I will turn it back over to Michelle and Patrick. Great. Thanks, Keith and Vicki. And with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Patrick and Scott to hear a little bit more uh, from the park's perspective. Great. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you to everyone for taking the time today to join us for this virtual meeting. Input from our community and other stakeholders plays a key role in management decisions within Bandelier National Monument. As Michelle said, I'm Patrick Sedeth. I'm the very new superintendent of the monument. In fact, this is only my third week at the helm of the park. Though I'm new to Bandelier, I have served the nation in the National Park Service for almost 30 years. Most recently, I served as the deputy superintendent at Independence National Historical Park in Philadelphia, caring for numerous historic buildings and landscapes, including Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. I've also served in a variety of Western National Parks, including Glacier National Park, Joshua Tree National Park, and Grand Canyon, to name a few. I was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and graduated from New Mexico State University. I have deep ties to New Mexico and to Bandelier, and I'm honored to have been chosen to lead the monument. 
At Bandelier National Monument, we serve as the proud stewards of a part of what was the ancestral and traditional lands of at least 23 tribal nations. And we recognize the long history of this land and the connections that people of these nations have to it to this day. It is our honor to serve as the current stewards. We seek to ensure that we manage all aspects of the monument in a way that demonstrates respect and reverence for our tribal partners and their ancestors with the understanding that their cultures, lifestyles, religious beliefs, and traditions continue to be shaped by their ties to the natural and cultural resources of the monument. In a couple of minutes, Scott McFarlane, the regional program lead for natural sounds and night skies, will talk a bit more about the resources at Bandelier, a subject he knows well as his last position in the National Park Service was the resource management program manager here at Bandelier. I wanna thank Scott for his continued support of this process in his new position. He has a wealth of knowledge about the resources and challenges that face the monument, and I deeply appreciate his involvement in this process. I don't think my selection to this position had anything to do with his departure, or at least that's what I'm going to continue to tell myself. Air tour operators and, and their impacts must be evaluated considering potential impacts to a variety of park resources and visitor experiences. Air tours have the ability to provide a unique perspective for many park visitors that may not have the ability to experience the park in other ways, including persons with mobility issues. Resources that must be considered in evaluating air tour operations in Bandelier include impacts to cultural resources, impacts to wildlife, impacts to wilderness, and impacts to the park's soundscapes. I would like to emphasize as I heard uh, Keith do earlier, before I turn it over to Scott, that one air tour operator currently operates in Bandelier National Monument. That operation solely operates a small fixed wing aircraft and on average flies over the parks 101 times a year. Through this planning process, one of the options that the park is considering would establish above ground limitations that are higher than what is currently allowed and could establish caps on the number of flights allowed for, 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 or differently put different caps among other restrictions that Scott will go over in a minute. I look forward to seeing and hearing your comments on this proposal. In addition to input from the public, we highly value the opinions and concerns of our tribal partners in this planning effort. We very much appreciate the many comments that have been submitted already. It is our hope that upon completion of this process, we will, we will be better able to manage current air tour operations and also create a framework to evaluate any future requests for air tour operations in a way that is logical, respectful of park resources and transparent to everybody. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to our moderator and to Scott so he can speak more specifically to the resources of Bandler National Monument. Thank you all for participating in this forum. Back to you, Michelle. Great. Thanks, Patrick. And I'll ping pong it back over now to Scott. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I'm Scott McFarland. Uh, I'm currently the field program lead for the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. As Patrick mentioned, I uh, was previously the resources program manager uh, at Bandelier, managing the natural resource and cultural resource programs. Bandelier is a, a monument that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I spent several years there, and it's an absolutely spectacular place in the country. Uh, it's about 34,000 acres, much of which is uh, congressionally designated wilderness. And it's most well known for the uh, high density of archaeological sites that exist throughout the park. In fact, there's over 3,000 documented sites that are mostly associated with the 1100 to 1550 AD period. Uh, but it's important, as Patrick mentioned, that this is a living landscape. And this landscape has served people for over 10,000 years. Um, there are sites that go back 10,000 years, and there are sites that are still used uh, presently by the uh, Pueblo people. So the park is also uh, pretty ecologically diverse. Um, it ranges in elevation from 5,000 feet to 10,000 feet. And we'll get into a few more of those resources, but that's just a general overview. 
Uh, next slide, please. So this is a map of the area of which we're discussing. Uh, so this is Bandelier National Monument uh, outlined there um, with the uh, black check marks. Uh, there's also a discontiguous unit called the Sankoe unit um, of Bandelier near the San Ildefonso Pueblo. Uh, the other Pueblo that abuts uh, Bandelier is Cochiti Pueblo. Uh, both of these Pueblos have very close ties uh, to the area managed by Bandelier as well as others. The other wilderness area you see on there is about 5,000 acres, and that is on the Santa Fe National Forest, the Dome Wilderness. And one last important thing about this map is this also displays the Valles Caldera National Preserve. Uh, the air tour management plan that we're discussing tonight only uh, pertains to Bandelier National Monument. There are currently no authorized air tours over the Valles Caldera. Next slide. So the land within Bandelier uh, is important to indigenous people throughout the Southwest, but of a particular importance to the Coach de Pueblo, uh, San Felipe, San Ildefonso, Santa Clara, the Kewa, and the Zuni people. And as I mentioned before, the park is still um, used heavily uh, by these Pueblo. So you know, it's something that we took into careful consideration when we were uh, creating this draft. Um, Bandelier is about uh, 34,000 acres, as I mentioned before, of that 23,267 acres um, are designated wilderness. And as I mentioned before, again, the, the park uh, has a pretty distinct elevation range. Uh, and within its boundaries, um, there are a wide variety of vegetative communities because of the elevation transition, as well as the presence of uh, perennial water, which is relatively rare in the Southwest. And some of the wildlife that you might see out in Bandelier um, that we took into consideration were, were bighorn sheep and Rio Grande cutthroat, and beaver and otter and black bear and pika and mountain lion. Uh, but there's also migratory birds. Um, there's raptors such as the peregrine falcon and zone tail hawk. And there are also two threatened and endangered species. So the Mexican spotted owl, which is federally listed as threatened, and the federally listed as endangered Hamas mountain salamander. Next slide, please. So as Patrick and, and Keith have mentioned, um, air tours at Bandelier have been going on um, for well over 20 years. So the air tour management plan draft is um, basically, um, you know, looking to manage those air flights um, from what is currently existing. So the existing conditions of the park, there's one air tour operator, their interim operating authority is for 126 flights per year. The three year average from 2017 to 2019, we didn't include 2020 for obvious reasons, uh, was 101 flights. And the annual number of commercial air tours at the park is limited by the ILA, so they cannot fly more flights than that. And there are currently no designated parameters on the route, time of day, altitude restrictions, training, procedures, no fly requirements, etc. Next slide. So the draft air tour management plan, uh, we took into consideration both the natural and cultural resource condition or concerns as well as the existing operations. So under the proposed um, air tour management plan or draft, there is 101 uh, air tours authorized per year. Uh, the operator would not be allowed to fly any lower than 2,600 feet above ground level. And because of the topography and bandolier uh, to avoid kind of up and down um, flights, it's within reference of the topographic high point within a half mile of the flight path. And it is limited to fixed wing aircraft only. That's a really important distinction. Uh, current air tours um, are only in a small single engine uh, fixed wing aircraft. There are no current helicopters um, flying over Bandelier. And we also put in some restrictions on the uh, time of day during which the operator can fly as well as established um, the option 
for temporary no-fly periods for special events or planned park management. So an example could be, you know, a cultural um, demonstration or a ceremony in the back country of the park. Next slide. This is a map of the proposed air tours over the park. Um, this is very similar to the flights that the operator is, is currently doing uh, with just a small adjustment on the red route. So I'll just leave this up for a minute so folks can take a look at that. And the arrows um, on the, the routes designate the direction of the flight. And next slide. So why are these the measures that, that we're proposing in our draft? Um, one is we recognize the cultural significance of Bandelier and the importance um, of the landscape to the indigenous uh, Pueblo people. And so that was a critical component. We also want to protect the park soundscapes, the visitor experience, wilderness character, as well as wildlife particularly um, peregrine falcon and uh, the Mexican spotted owl. And as I mentioned before, um, you know, setting a, a higher above ground level um, for the flight paths reduces the overall noise footprint um, across the landscape. Next slide. We also wanted to reduce the intensity of air tour noise to visitors. So, you know, if you're a visitor and you're out in the backcountry and you've hiked way out into the wilderness, uh, we wanted to protect your ability to seek and experience solitude. We also wanted to put a, a, a number on air tours um, so that, you know, they couldn't creep up over time um, and that would be consistent with the, the current operations. And also uh, to you know, enacted a requirement to have training and education um, and as well as an annual meeting um, to make sure that the ATMP is effectively implemented. Next slide. And back to you, Keith. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Patrick. Very good information on the park and the park-specific uh, air tour management plan. Um, as I mentioned earlier on previous slides, and I think Vicki alluded to as well, um, there is a compliance requirement uh, for the agencies regarding the National Environmental Policy Act. The development of this air tour management plan is considered a federal action subject to NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act compliance. NEPA requires that the agencies consider um, the potential effects um, from this action, which is the development of the air tour management plan which is basically kind of the operating parameters associated with the air tours uh, in terms of potential effects over the park. And um, we need to consider the human and natural environment in terms of um, this action and what those effects would be. We also have to determine the appropriate level of environmental review. There's various categories or levels of environmental review from categorically excluded actions in terms of documentation, environmental assessments or environmental impact statements. Um, and we also are required to prepare associated environmental review documents as part of this uh, process. At this time, currently, the agencies are considering the development of this ATMP um, under a National Park Service categorical exclusion. Um, it's important to note, however, that the agencies will be considering, obviously, the public comments that receive on this draft air tour management plan as part of this 30-day review that we're about halfway through at this point, as well as information uh, obtained from the various consultation processes, including section 106 and section seven, which we'll talk about here shortly. And we're gonna fully assess the environmental impacts associated with the air tour management plan before we make that final decision on the appropriate level um, of environmental review. Next slide, please. I want to mention that there's also a couple of special purpose laws that the agencies need to um, comply with. Um, there's Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and then there's Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act. 
Um, so currently the FAA and Park Service are in the process of going through that section 106 consultation. Uh, requires us um, to define the undertaking. The undertaking in this case is the development of the air tour management plan and identify consulting parties, which we've um, identified at this point. Also determine the area of potential effects and as part of that, identify historic properties within the APE or area of potential effects. Assess the effects of the overflights of the air tours to those historic properties and then ultimately res um, resolve any adverse effects um, to those historic properties, if any. The agencies, we have initiated consultation with the relevant state historic preservation office, SHPO, tribes, and consulting parties uh, for this park unit. And with that, I will turn it, uh, go to the next slide, and I think I will turn it back to Michelle for this one. Yep, great. Thanks, Keith. So as Keith mentioned, the FAA and the National Park Service are complying with, also complying with Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, as they develop the draft ATMP. And this is to ensure that the proposed action does not jeopardize the existence of any species that's listed under ESA or result in the destruction or adverse modification of designated critical habitat. The agencies have begun informal consultation um, and conversations with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the preliminary assessment by the agencies is that they're not anticipating these types of impacts. Next slide, please. So as noted earlier and as described through the presentations, uh, we're currently inviting comment from the public and the tribes, from other agencies and all interested parties on the draft that is posted for review and comments need to be received by October 3rd. Um, they can be submitted in one of two ways, either online through the National Park Service public comment website, which you'll see uh, the link on the screen. And um, you can also submit written comments to the address you'll see there. If for some reason during the presentation, you want that address and you aren't able to write it down, you'll be able to also get it from the parks, Pepsi or the, the public comment website. And just a reminder that the agencies are not accepting public comments via email. I also would like to let you know that there's a FAQ or a frequently asked question document that's posted on the parks website alongside the draft ATMP. And if somebody from FAA could drop the link to the Pepsi page into the social media platforms, it might be nice for people to have that link. Next slide, please. So following the end of our public comment period, FAA and the NPS will review all of the public comments and they'll use them to inform the final ATMP. They'll continue to coordinate and complete the tribal, the section 106 uh, and section seven consultations, and they'll conclude the process um, by signing a, a decision document. And once all of this is wrapped up, the ATMP will be considered complete and it will be available on both the park and the FAA websites. FAA will then update their operations specifications for each air tour operator. Next slide, please. All right, and so with that, I'd like to say thank you to all of our presenters, and we'll now turn to the Q&A portion of the meeting. For anybody that may have joined during the presentations, I'm Michelle Carter. I'm an environmental protection specialist with the National Park Service, and I'm the moderator of the meeting this evening. And uh, if you have a question you'd like to submit, you can post it into the Google form using the link shared by FAA in the chat area of whatever platform you're using. And as a reminder, the questions that you submit today will be considered by the agencies as they continue developing the draft ATMP, but they're, they're not formal comments. I mentioned a little bit ago, all formal comments must be submitted either via the planning environment, public comment, or Pepsi website, or sent to that mailing address we just showed. Um, and again, both of those are displayed here on the slide. And October 3rd is the date for the comments. 
So as noted at the beginning of the meeting, it's gonna be a 90 minute session. We'll adjourn at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And in the event that all of the questions are answered before that time, we'll continue to hold the meeting to allow for additional questions to come in after you've had a chance to, to think about and reflect on some of the presentations. Um, during that time, we may go off camera or go um, off mic for a little bit, but we'll keep the meeting live to give everybody a chance to think about what they've heard. Um, and I think with that, it does look like we've had some questions come in. So let me go over here um, to our first question. Um, I'll direct this to Vicki with the National Park Service. The question is, why are you trying to introduce air tours to the park? Sure, Michelle, I'll, I'll answer that question. And, and thank you, whoever sent in that question. Uh, it's not introducing hair tours into to Bandelier. They have been occurring there for many years. And uh, as mentioned earlier, one operator has been authorized to fly up to 126 tours per year using interim operating authority. Um, as we mentioned earlier too, that that interim operating authority doesn't set routes or operating conditions uh, for those air tours except to limit the number of air tours permitted to fly each year. So uh, yeah, these tours have been happening for a long time. Uh, you know, on, on average, they've been happening about 101 tours uh, reported per year. And that's the annual that amount that's proposed in the draft air tour management plan, which is a reduction from the current maximum allowed. Uh, and that draft air tour management plan uh, would include the, the routes, the altitudes, and those uh, additional conditions that were described a bit earlier that are designed to protect natural and cultural resources and visitor experience. So uh, by establishing those routes, aircraft type, or you know, the, the yearly the cap, uh, that is to protect those park resources and visitor experience. And without a putting an air tour management plan in place, uh, none of those conditions would exist except for the maximum under interim operating authority. Thanks for the question. Back to you, Michelle. Great, thanks, Vicki. Um, and this next one, I think Keith may have kind of addressed it uh, during his presentation, but we'll go ahead and, um, and bring it up here, Keith. The question is, uh, what flights does this plan apply to? Are military planes included? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, military flights are not included in our air tour management plan. As I mentioned previously, uh, the National Parks Air Tour Management Act specifically applies to commercial air tour operations. FAA regulations define a commercial air tour operation under 14 CFR Part 136, and it's basically a flight conducted for compensation or hire in a powered aircraft for purposes of sightseeing um, over a national park or within a half mile of the park boundary. And as I mentioned previously, in regards to the airspace or altitude requirement to be considered an air tour, it's basically between ground level and 5,000 feet above ground level uh, while you're in that airspace over the park or the half mile uh, boundary of the park. So again, we don't look at, at any type of general aviation activity that may be transiting the area or any military operations or commercial scheduled airline type of flights. Uh, sometimes there is some confusion about um, that with, with folks. So we're happy to clear that up. Again, we're the, the focus, the primary and only focus for the air tour management plan is commercial air tour operations. And in this case at Bandelier, uh, the one existing air tour operator who's been uh, conducting flights um, out there for a number of years. Great, thank you, Keith. Um, the next question, um, we'll go ahead and have Vicki, I think, take a shot at this. Keith did kind of cover it a little bit in his presentation, but maybe Vicki would have a different, um, some context here. So the question is, will NEPA analysis be conducted to inform air tour management? Okay, 
Yeah, thanks, Michelle, and thanks for that question. Yes, absolutely, we are conducting an analysis of the existing routes, those parameters that are proposed in the draft director management plan. And as we reviewed those, we are considering using a National Park Service categorical exclusion, which is a level of NEPA review under, under the National Environmental Policy Act. And the categorical exclusion we are considering using is, I'm gonna read the numbers, so just pardon my looking aside here, it's 3.3A1, and that is from the National Park Service Environmental Policy Act handbook. And that categorical exclusion is defined as uh, actions that are allowing changes or amendments to an approved action. And in this case, it's the interim operating authority. Uh, when the changes would cause no or only minimal impact, and with the parameters that are being put in place with the routes and altitudes, that would cause some uh, beneficial impacts to the park. Um, so we are completing an analysis of the effects, which uh, consistent with NEPA. Uh, the type of documentation that is most appropriate to the analysis, we're not, you know, it's not final yet. Uh, so we're, it's gonna be informed by the feedback we received during this public review period on this draft air to management plan to identify if additional effects that have not yet been identified and analyzed exist and whether there's the potential or not for the potential for adverse impacts that would make a different NEPA pathway more appropriate, such as an environmental assessment, instead of a documented categorical exclusion, which is what we're considering at this point. So like I said, we will consider the public comments received, information obtained from consultations, and fully assess the environmental impacts before making a final determination on what the NEPA pathway is appropriate. And uh, just a reminder to that a categorical exclusion does not mean it's excluded from the National Environmental Policy Act. It means it's, ex it's excluded from needing to prepare an environmental impact statement. I uh, hope that answered the question. And thank you. Yeah, Vicki, thank you for that additional detail. That was helpful. Um, okay, the next question, we'll go back over to Keith with FAA. The question is, have the Pueblos, including the Pueblo Council, given their input, and have they been consulted with about how to respect the park lands? So our 106 uh, process is uh, underway and ongoing in accordance with the act, um, tribes whose land may be overflowed blown by commercial air tour um, of the park have been invited to participate as cooperating agencies under NEPA. Uh, additionally, all tri tribes that attach religious or cultural significance to the lands within the parks have been invited to participate in consultations under section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. We will, both agencies will obviously consider tribal and local Pueblo concerns in the development of these air tour management plans. Um, we really encourage you to comment um, on the draft air tour management plan that is out there. There's obviously going to be further follow up via the 106 um, consultation process. Um, back in March of this year, uh, we sent out letters to, I think, 28 federally rec recognized tribes um, specifically for this um, air tour management plan at Bandelier. Um, more recently, at the end of August, so about a couple of weeks ago, uh, we send out letters uh, to those same tribes uh, regarding um, defining the undertaking, which is the development of the air tour management plan, um, as, as well as getting their um, input on uh, what is the area of uh, potential effect. So that 106 consultation process will be ongoing. We will not be wrapping up uh, or finalizing the ATMP until we have gotten through that 106 consultation process um, and have um, had an opportunity to engage with the tribe, understand their concerns, and uh, reflect those concerns in the, in the, final, in the final plan. Um, also, coordinating with the State Historic Preservation Office as well as other consulting parties, 
including, I, I think in this case, a uh, adjacent uh, forest service land. I, know, I think we reached out to Los Alamos National Labs. I think they declined uh, to participate. Um, and we also included uh, the air tour operator as well. So hope that answers uh, your question, but certainly that's an important aspect of um, this overall process is getting uh, tribal input and having that reflected in the plan. Very much so. Thanks, Keith. Um, okay, so the next question is, um, is there any possibility that the NPS will allow recreational drone usage in designated open areas in NPS territories in the future. This given that it's monitored by the NPS rangers in that designated area and other safety precautions put into place to allow this type of usage, recreational drone usage. Um, so the ATMP does not actually cover drones. Um, and just a, a note that, that actually la launching, landing, uh, or operating unmanned aircraft, which are the drones uh, from national park lands, is prohibited. So, but thanks for that question. Um, okay, going down here, um, Keith, if you don't mind coming back on, um, there's somebody that just is interested in the National Park Service and FAA not going forward with the plan. So can you just speak to that a little bit? So the act requires uh, agencies to develop a plan for any park where there are commercial air tour operations that wouldn't qualify um, for the exempt in, exemption to be an exempt park, i.e. those with 50 or fewer annual air tour operations. As I mentioned earlier, and as we've discussed here, this operator is flying in the neighborhood of 101 um, air tours and has the authorization to fly up to 126 on an annual basis without any other uh, restrictions. So um, actually the development of an air tour management plan would allow us to more effectively uh, manage those air tours. We still need to comply with the act. We would still need to get a, a plan in place. Um, that plan that we're developing has defined altitudes, defined routes, uh, time of day in terms of when you can start operation, start conducting a tour over the park and when you need to finish uh, a tour over the park for those sensitive morning and evening hours um, and some other type of um, restrictions um, and uh, mitigations, if you will, to help protect uh, park resources. So certainly there's benefits as well as the requirement by law that we need to, we need to have a final air tour management plan uh, for this park. Great, thanks for the clarification, Keith. So um, I, the next question is related, goes back to the, the consultation. And um, I think for this one, we'll have Vicki come on if you're okay with it. And the question um, is about you know, uh, the National Park Service and the FAA saying that, that they have consulted with the tribes. And this, the individual said from their understanding that the local Pueblos are against the plan. And so what recommendations specifically have we, has the, has the agencies applied uh, from the local tribe councils? Yeah, sure, Michelle, I'll, I'll do my best to answer that question. I, as Keith mentioned earlier, a tribal consultation is going on with local Pueblos. We're not done with that yet. Uh, in addition, comments can be submitted through the NPS Pepsi site. And, and we are considering the comments received on the draft air tour management plan. It is still a draft at this point. And we will continue those consultations with other agencies and local Pueblos and tribal governments as necessary. A final ATMP will be prepared in consideration of the comments received in consultations. Uh, the final ATMP will be approved by both FAA and the NPS. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Um, next, going back over to Keith, the question is, why is the number of annual authorized tours being reduced 
reduced from 126 to 120 to 101, sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, so really the starting point, the benchmark, if you will, is that 126 number. As I mentioned, this is an existing air tour operator as defined under the act. He was, he applied to uh, the FAA for operating authority and Based on that application, he provided us with the number of air tours. I don't know in this case whether he based it off the year previous to 2000 or the three-year average prior to 2000, and the number was 126, and that was the interim operating authority number that we granted to this operator. He can continue to fly at that level um, without any other restrictions, really, except not to exceed that annual limit until such time as we develop the plan. Um, so really that number, interim operating authority, was granted to operators, not just this operator, but to all operators nationally that were conducting tours at the time over national park units. And it was reflected of uh, kind of the operating conditions, if you will, um, at that time that the legislation passed. Since then, one of the other amendment provisions that um, came out of the 2012 amendments to the act was the requirement to provide reporting information. Prior to that, the agencies really didn't have any good data about the number of tours that the operators were actually doing over the park other than kind of that benchmark interim operating authority number. Um, in 2013, we stood up the reporting requirements and since then, we have basically now seven or eight years worth of reporting data from these air tour operators at all these national park units. They're required to report to us on a quarterly basis the number of air tours that they conduct um, over a park unit. So we have more fresher, more recent information in the development of this air tour management plan at it most of the other parks that were working, uh, the other 23 parks that Vicki had mentioned previously, the parks, uh, I'm sorry, the Park Service and the FAA decided to utilize this more recent data that we had that tells us kind of what's the more recent activity by these air tour operators over these national park units. We decided to focus in on the 2017, 2019 timeframe as being really kind of very recent data. It also wasn't 2020, which was important to us because 2020 was uh, kind of influenced quite heavily at a lot of parks in terms of the, uh, the COVID restrictions on all types of activities, including air tours at national parks. So uh, kind of a long answer, but we felt it was relevant in the development of this plan to not just go with interim operating authority as a starting number, but to look at more recent activity, take a three-year average um, that the operators were, were doing over the park and um, throw in other measures as needed to protect park resources. In this case, um, you know, they talked about the uh, increase in the elevation on the routes and some of those other things. So anyways, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Keith. Um, should have told you to keep your camera on. I think we'll have this next question. Actually, my apologies. I've jumped around here a little bit as new questions are coming in. Um, we'll go over here to Vicki. Um, so Vicki, there's a question here. Can you break down the economics of this plan? Does any money actually go into the local communities or towards improving local social sciences? Um, does any of it go to the Pueblos? So, thanks in advance, Vicki. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. Um, I think some of the question might be, uh, you know, are there any fees charged for air tours and how would that work? Um, the NPS is only authorized to collect air tour fees at a few parks and that was, uh, authority was under the omnibus 
Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993. Uh, so that only covered uh, parks like Grand Canyon, Haleakala National Park, and Hawaii Volcano. So currently, uh, we do not collect fees for air tours over Vandiller National Monument. So there would be no fee, there's no fee money going to the park or in to the local community. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Vicki. So it looks like questions are still slowly rolling in here. Um, okay, so We'll go back over to Keith now for, for our next question. The, it, they're asking if, we, if, if the agencies have a record of the percentage of people with mobility issues, like how many people with mobility issues have been on the air tours, and if we don't, is that a number that we could get access to? That, so I mentioned the recently implemented reporting requirements. That is not a statistic that we require the air tour operators to provide to us. I've never seen anything um, published anywhere regarding those types of statistics. I would imagine they would be fairly hard to come by. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if the, the operators would be, you know, specifically tracking that information either, other than maybe anecdotally, you know, indicating that um, some of the passenger um, volume that they do provide the tours to um, do go to those 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 types of folks. Um, so uh, I, th I think it would be very hard to, to get our hands on those numbers and I, I doubt we could uh, be able to provide that information. Okay, thanks Keith. We have a question here for Vicki, I think. Um, why no fly option to protect um, visitor from aircraft noise? And so, yeah, why, why isn't there a no fly option um, to protect the national parks and, and visitors from the, noise, the overall air tour noise? Uh, sure, Michelle. Uh, yeah, thanks. No, we, we would encourage anyone who wants to see changes made to the draft or to management plan to submit their comments in Pepsi. Uh, under current oper interim operating authority, the one operator is authorized to fly up to 126 air tours per year. Uh, the ATMP would set this at actually 101, and that would include the conditions for the routes, the altitudes, aircraft type, time of day restrictions, and the restrictions for particular events. But, and that is not currently happening under the current interim operating authority. So again, please submit your comments through Pepsi. Thank you. Thanks, Vicki. Okay. Keith, um, I think this question would go back over to you. Uh, it's about new entrants and mm -hmm. the question is asking how new entrants are gonna be dealt with um, at this area and just other areas that are subject to ATMPs. Yeah, sure. Um, and make sure I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, there is um, provisions in the act um, to accommodate new entrant operators at park units. Um, that's always been an option since the act came into effect. We really haven't had a lot of new entrant applications over the, the number of years since the act went into effect. There, um, basically, they need to apply to the FAA for operating authority before conducting commercial air tours um, over areas covered by an air tour management plan. Um, the FAA and the Park Service will, will be publishing additional information for interested parties about the form and required content of new entrant applications um, under the air tour management plan. We have not uh, to my knowledge, had any new entrant requests at Bandelier. We don't have any on the table right now. We just have that one existing um, operator. Um, but the process would be if they did apply, that the agencies would review those um, applications submitted prior to the effective date of an air tour management plan. 
um, and we would commence that within six months of the effective date. Applications submitted after that time would be considered no less frequently than um, I think every three years from the effective date of an air tour management plan. And the effective date of an air tour management plan is uh, when it when it is signed. Great, thanks, Keith. So it looks like we um, still have meeting participants that are. Are typing away questions and they're looks like we they're coming in like as we speak so we're gonna um give folks a little bit of time here to keep submitting your questions and um in the meantime uh, we'll keep the meeting live as we said earlier and uh, we'll go off camera and go off mic but we're here um just so that uh everybody has a chance to think about their questions think about what they heard and um and we're we're here to answer those questions, so please keep them coming. We'll be back on in just a moment. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all for keeping the questions coming in. I think this next one, um, we'll turn it over to Patrick. And if anybody else has something to chime in afterward, you certainly can. Um, but the, the question is, um, if the operator has been flying at Bandelier for decades, then it obviously hasn't been noticed. Aircraft at 2600 AGL are not noisy. Um, as stated here in this comment, can you equate the amount of noise generated from a Cessna 182 at 2600 AGL? Um, and for anybody on the line that may not know what AGL is, it's, it's above ground level. So Patrick, thanks for taking a stab at that one. Sure, and it's it's going to be a little bit of a wild stab. It's a it's a technical question, and unfortunately, I, I don't um, have the, the, those technical specs um, for you at this time. Um, I'm sure we can find it, it's, it but we, we don't have it in, in preparation for this meeting. Uh, I would say that, um, that the assertion that nobody noticed is probably not completely accurate. I, I think I have, in my short time here, I've had, um, I've had people comment on it. So I, I wouldn't say that's completely accurate. And I, and I would also um, note that, it, that an, an air tour is perceived to a visitor on, on, a, on a whole bunch of different factors, including the proximity to the flight path, the type of the aircraft, um, other sources of noise, and and other um, soundscape features in the in the surrounding visitor in the in the surrounding features. Um, so, a visitors near an aircraft's flight path are, are probably more likely to hear it overhead. But that's not necessarily the the only thing that would affect how a visitor would perceive um, aircraft noise. And I would also note that that uh, that um, aircraft noise is just one of the many factors that this plan is evaluating when it comes to, um, to, to how these, these flights will be, will be ultimately permitted or not permitted. So back to you, Michelle. Great, thanks for that. Okay, looks like we have a 
couple more coming in. Um, so there's somebody asking about, about the process for comments and uh, wondering if letters or emails would be more effective. Um, and uh, I, I had mentioned at one point in the presentation that um, we um, are not actually accepting formal comments via email. Um, if you have a clarifying question that like we don't answer to today, answer today, um, you can we'll share an email address later that you can submit your questions to if it will help you like refine your formal comment. But uh, the most effective way of making sure that your comments are included included in our record is either submitting them um, online through the we call it the Pepsi page, the public planning environment and public comment. Um, so that link is there. Or if you prefer to send something uh, like hard copy mail, the address uh, for hard copy letters is listed there. And if for some reason you want to send a hard copy letter, but you don't jot down that um, that address at the time, you can go to the Pepsi page and the address is also listed there. So official comments that will be part of the record must be submitted either hard copy mail or via Pepsi uh, by Sunday, October 3rd. So, so thanks for that. Okay, let's see here. What else we have? Well, it looks like folks are still busily typing. We have a couple more um, coming in. So just out of respect for your time, we're gonna give, you, give the audience a, a few more minutes to keep their questions coming in, we'll go off video for just a minute, but um, as soon as folks have had a chance to, to get their questions submitted through the Google form, we'll come back on and be sure to answer the questions. So thank you for all of this. It's a, a lot of really good, thoughtful questions. Great, man, the, the questions are really coming in. Thank you guys for being so active. 
Um, so we'll go ahead here um, with a question for Keith. Um, what is the timeline for the NHPA uh, section, section 106 process? Well, the short answer is um, we're, we're not going to complete the final ATMP until 106 process is done. That being said, there is no defined timeline um, at, at this point. Really, the consultation process doesn't lend itself to rigid time limits um, or deadlines because really the purpose of the 106 process um, is to uncover and explore issues that really aren't apparent to the agencies since we don't have all the information and insight um, um, that the tribes and other consulting parties may have. So that's really the short answer. And as I mentioned before, that 106 consultation process um, is, is ongoing. Um, there's still a lot more to do um, along that path. Um, but again, I think the, the major takeaway is we wouldn't finalize the ATMP until that 106 process um, is complete. And Keith, I'll actually have you keep your camera on here. There's oh. that um, seems like it might be a, a good fit. The question is, uh, are there currently air tours still operating while the ATMP is being considered or have they been halted until the plan is finalized? Uh, no, so the air tours are ongoing by that one existing air tour operator. As previously mentioned, he applied for and was granted interim operating authority back in roughly 2003 timeframe. Um, since then, he has been able to conduct up to 126 air tours um, a year um, until such time as we develop the plan. So um, he's able to continue to fly um, even during the time that we're developing the plan. Once the plan does come into effect, um, since he is the operator identified in the plan, he would need to adhere to uh, the operating parameters uh, that are identified um, in the air tour management plan. And that would then subsequently be referenced in his operation specifications. Great, thanks for that, Keith. Um, okay, so, so the question is um, about legislation. Legislation, legislation restricted commercial air tours over Alaska parks, Grand Canyon, and Rocky Mountain, but have the FAA and the NPS as agencies Ever, ever promulgated a rule that entirely restricts commercial air tours over national parks. So Vicki, if you could take a stab at that one. Sure, I, and I think the first part of this is referring to what we went over earlier in the presentation about uh, what the National Parks Air Tour Management uh, does or does not cover. So I, I just have a couple points I want to clarify about commercial air tours. I'm going to take it in three parts. So first for the Alaska parks, air tours uh, do occur over the Alaska parks. However, most of those are being managed under commercial youth authorizations or concession contracts because they frequently land in the parks. So those are uh, addressed through a different uh, process. If a, if a tour is just flying right over the over an Alaska park it is not covered by the National Air National Parks Air Tour Management Act. So it doesn't mean that they're they're not occurring. It's just that they're could be managed under a different uh, mechanism uh, if they're landing in the parks. Uh, Grand Canyon. Uh, Grand Canyon, Air Tours over Grand Canyon have been happening there for decades. There are I think up to 100,000 air tour and air tour related air tours happening over Grand Canyon. They are managed through a special flight rules area that was uh, authorized under the Overflights Act 1987. 
So that's why Grand Canyon is not covered under the National Park Territory Management Act. And then for Rocky Mountain National Park, there is a specific uh, section in the National Park Territory Management Act that prohibits commercial air tours over Rocky Mountain National Park. That is the only other park that I'm aware of that has a specific uh, ban like that. That's it's in legislation. Uh, so um, the agencies, uh, FAA and NPS, have, we have not promulgated a rule, which is a different process than what we're doing under an air tour management plan that would entirely restrict commercial air tours over national parks. So I hope that answered the question. <laughs> uh, thanks. That was um, a lot of information to, to convey. So I, I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Vicki. Um, okay, so next question back over to Patrick. Um, so this is citing, um, the commenter is citing a 1994 report to Congress on uh, national park overflights. Um, and it identified Bandelier is one of eight priority parks most in need of uh, resolution of airspace space issues. Uh, so the question, the question is, is what, where, uh, what were then the, the priority issues of airspace concern at Bandelier? And uh, please summarize the outcomes uh, with a single year. Um, I apologize. I'm, I'm reading this and saying it at the same time. So please summarize the outcome sense with the single year stated tour operator for resolving the airspace issues. And uh, as the years, decades passed, why uh, after passage of Napatma was there no voluntary plan uh, attempted? And why was it not worked out if so far? So I hope you got all of that, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. Thank you, Michelle. And I'm, I apologize that I seem to be the one to, to be um, speaking to the questions that we don't have a good answer for right away um, this, this evening. Uh, our quick uh, search of, of our documents um, found some references to that in some of the appendixes of the reports, but I, I'm unable at this time to find the specifics that, uh, that the, the, um, the participant is asking for. Uh, so, so it's going to take us a little time, and unfortunately, I'm not going to have a satisfying answer for you tonight about what those airspace issues were. Um, I, I can say that I know from the recent history of the park that we really don't have any pressing airspace issues, and I don't believe that we have for some time. So it's going to it's going to have to take us a little time to figure out what what the issue was that that caused for that um, that uh, that reference to be made. So once again, I we will we will do some follow up on that, um, but I, I'm not going to be able to answer that for you tonight, but thank you for the question and we will follow up. Great, thanks for that, Patrick. I'm sorry to give you the some of the tougher questions, but thanks for responding and being willing to follow up. Um, it looks like we just need another minute or two. People are still typing. I know we're kind of coming into the end of the meeting, but we'd like to give folks like, a chance if um, it does look like there's some typing for a couple of last minute questions to come in. So I'm gonna go off camera just here for a second and give folks a chance to finalize typing and we'll be back here for a couple of final answers for you.
Okay, thanks for the questions that keep coming in here. Uh, so let's go back to you, Patrick. Um, have, how have you involved the local Pueblos other than just sending letters? Hey, thanks. Thank you, Michelle. So um, my full intent with, with this and, and every other major decision that we're making in the park is that I wanna have full involvement of, of, of every single one of the Pueblos or the tribes that have an interest in the situation or identify that they have an interest in whatever the process is. Um, in this particular kind of structured planning process, um, we are, I, I acknowledge that we have a government to government relationship with each of these nations. And, and as such, the process uh, can be very, very formal. We are, we are in a stage of, of this process where we are gathering information and, and gauging interest and, 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 and that is just where we are. Um, I, I fully would anticipate that there'll be ample opportunities uh, for, for the tribes to make their, their, uh, their positions known and, and know, and know that, that those, those comments will be heard and those comments will be respected. But, but this is, uh, it, it may not be satisfying at this point to be into a public meeting and to and to not know that your your uh, your tribal nation um, or at least not feel that your tribal nation has been fully consulted. But this is a very formal process, and as a government to government relationship, these things are somewhat structured. And um, but but know that that will not lessen the impact of your comments. So I hope that I hope that it gets to that, Michelle. Okay. Yeah, and if you don't mind, there's another one um, related to that. Uh, there's a, a question about um, tribal representation um, and why was there not tribal representation on the call today? And uh, why are the representatives of the Pueblo not on the panel? Well, that, that, that relates directly to, to what I was just talking about. It is a formal government to government relationship and, and it is therefore a very structured process. So, so we are not we are not at that stage yet. I, I hope that very shortly um, we will be standing side by side in 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 a in a decision that is you know mutually acceptable to, to every party concerned. But but because this is such a structured and formal process, this is just where we are. Okay. Thank, thanks, Patrick. Um, Coming up on the end, we have a couple more questions here, but uh, we'll go we'll go with this one last question, um, and then I'll be able to share more information if your questions were not answered. Um, where you can go to get uh, more clarifying information. Um, for this last question, uh, we'll go over to Scott, uh, and the question is: Please expound upon uh, the reasoning behind the minimum flight altitude of twenty six hundred feet above the highest point within one half mile of an aircraft. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. And I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Um, it, there are numerous reasons why we landed on that 2,600 feet AGL, um, but one of them was due to the presence of uh, several noise sensitive species, including raptors. Uh, I mentioned peregrine falcon earlier and Mexican spotted owl. Uh, there's literature um, and scientific reports out there uh, regarding the, the noise levels that it requires uh, to cause like a noticeable disturbance uh, to those particular species. So uh, bumping the flight paths up to 2,600 feet um, results in no effect to those species. So that was the, the main reason. And the other reason for doing um, that is if we wanted to lower that, um, we would need to analyze those routes every single year. Raptors aren't fixed in any given location uh, within the monument. And every year they might have a new nest site or they might be present in a new area. Um, so instead of having to shift the routes every single year and, and try to locate those birds and um, make sure that we're protecting them, uh, it made more sense to just move the, the AGL up. Okay, thank you, Scott. So we're at the end of the time here. Um, I'd like to turn it over to, to Patrick just for quick closing remarks before um, I close us out with some final information. So Patrick. Thank you again, Michelle. And, and I very much wanna thank again, everyone for taking time this evening to participate in this forum. 
I sincerely hope that we've been able to shed some light onto this planning process and answer some of your questions and concerns. Again, all of your comments that are submitted via the, the means outlined earlier will be carefully about considered as we evaluate these proposals. Uh, please know to, as in response to the, to the many uh, inquiries about the tribal consultation that that, that, that process is just beginning and uh, that I am anxious to, to hear what all of our, our um, partners in the Pueblos um, have to say. I wanna thank all of our partners in the FAA and the Park Service's Regional and Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division for their continued support. And a big thanks to all of our presenters this evening. It brings me great joy to know that there are so many friends and stewards of Bandelier out there that clearly show such strong connections to the park. I'm thrilled to know that there are so many of you out there that hold this park as dear to your hearts as I do. Thank you for your continued interest in stewardship in Bandelier National Monument. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening and good night. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so just a little bit of last minute reminders. If anybody did join us late, I just wanted to point you back to the Pepsi site and know that there are some frequently asked questions there that may help if there was something you submitted tonight that we were not able to answer. Um, there, there were some unanswered questions. We couldn't get to everything. So if you do still want to reach out, um, if the partners with FAA could drop the email address into the chat feature, it's band underscore visitor underscore center at nps.gov. So that email address will be available in the chat if you have additional clarifying questions. Um, and again, the address is not for public comment, but it's just like if, if, if you had additional questions that would help you further refine the comment that you formally submit. Um, the Pepsi site is listed here on the slide, as well as the address where you can submit the written comments and the deadline for submitting these is October 3rd of this year. We had a lot of great questions, a lot of interaction. Thank you, like Patrick said, for participating um, on behalf of both the FAA and the National Park Service. We look forward to hearing from you and Pepsi. And we hope you have a good rest of your evening. Take care. <laughs>